Sheet steel. Hi, it's Todd of Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here. And today we're gonna to start messing around with arrows and my lockdown longbow. So I have a bundle of arrows here that have come from Will Sherman of Medieval Arrows. Fantastic Fletcher, a good bowman, but a fantastic Fletcher and Arrowsmith. First arrow we're gonna be testing is this one here, type seven needle bodkin, really from 12th through to about the 14th century. Next one up, type nine short bodkin, uh, really 14th, 15th, even up into the beginning of the 16th century a little bit. This one is an M2, so really 15th and 16th century. Uh, it's often known as a Towton or a Tudor bodkin, and these last two are the classic type 16. The one on your right is mild steel. The one on your left is wrought iron socket with hardened steel edges, barbs, welded on half percent carbon or thereabouts. Uh, good against flesh, sort of similar ones obviously used for hunting through the years. But these very much were a military head. Now the interesting thing is of all of the arrowhead types that we've got, there's very, very little evidence of any of them being made or of steel or using steel in their construction, except for type 16s. Now that's interesting in its own right because they don't really look like armor piercers to me. So what are they doing with steel in them? So what the hell am I up to with these beautiful medieval arrows and this 10 year old rather dodgy Chinese compound crossbow? Well, it's really simple. I can't shoot a proper heavyweight medieval longbow. But what I did do in the last film is I established that if I take an arrow of around about, let's say 75, 80 grams, and I shoot it out of this crossbow, what I do is I get the right kind of arrow speeds that an English longbowman would get. So I'm getting around about 180, 190 feet per second. I don't know what that is in metric, I'm sorry. Now, if we look at these little clips here from Joe Gibbs's films, you can see that the Mary Rose bows are achieving these. So my argument here is, if you take an arrow of the right length and the right shape and the right materials and you propel it at the right speed, the target doesn't know whether it's a longbow or a crossbow that shot it. So what I can do is I can cheat. And I can do my tests cheating myself here without having to get loads of people in every time. And what are we going to shoot in these films? Well, we're going to try and shoot pretty much everything. Cure billet, boiled leather. Used to make armour out of that. Sheet steel. Gamberson. They also used to put mail uh, under it or over it. So we'll have a look at that as well. Again, thank you for correcting me. I didn't realise they wore these two in combination. So we'll try that, find out what happens. Arming doublet, we'll try it with the mail on top of that. Ackerton, so this stuff, stuffed cotton one, again, we'll give it a go, see what it does. And then, of course, we've got other ones that, to look at. Like, for instance, what happens if you've got your lovely planked poplar shield and your arm is behind it? Does the arrow go straight through that and through your arm? And then, of course, there's that classic, wonderful myth that a longbow arrow goes through a three-inch oak door. Well, let's find out. First thing you need to know is that I am going to put wax on the arrowheads. I made a previous film about flexible armour and the question was, did putting wax on the arrowheads do anything to their ability to penetrate flexible armour? And the answer was yes, absolutely it did. It nearly doubled the depth through flexible armour that these needle bodkins would pass. That is a massive difference. There is absolutely no evidence at all, medieval-wise, that they did that. So why am I doing it? Is this some sort of great cheat? Well, I'll explain my thinking. Our medieval forebears were very, very good at observing the result of their actions and then deciding whether to carry on or not. As I've always said, they might not have had the words, but they were not stupid. They understood what was going on around them in their world. Now, if you take this arrow here, they knew if they made the fletches smaller and shorter, the arrow would fly further. They knew if they took the binding off, the arrow would fly further. They knew that if they bobtailed this, they tapered it all the way down to the back from the front, it would go further. They knew all these things, right? They didn't have the science to tell them why, they just worked it out. Another thing that they knew was that arrows spun when they were in the air, and that helps, you know, a bent shaft go straighter. So they could put their fletchings on helically, they could put their fletchings deliberately on at an angle, and that makes the arrow spin more. But look at this, this is a crossbow bolt, very typical of a crossbow bolt from around 1400. It's got wooden fletches on it, right? I've done another film about wooden fletches, but we're not talking about that today. Now look at that curve. That's a wing section. 650 years before the Wright brothers took their first flight, people were making crossbow bolts with wing sections. They had no idea why that did it. It worked. And this is my thinking behind the wax. 
Somebody at some point da- dip their arrowhead in wax, stop corrosion, make an extra special treat for the customer, whatever it might have been. And somebody came back to the smith and just went, you know what, those arrowheads, boy, they went through armour. And somebody went, ding, there's an idea. And I bet every last penny I've got that in the medieval world, they would wax their arrowheads. That's my thinking. I've got no evidence, but that's my take on it. So I'm going to wax the heads. Now, the next point that I'm going to do is I'm going to run these tests with all my samples on this stuff, which is just a roofing insulation. What I want is a stable, homogenous, continuous, reliable backstop for my material so I can test one thing against another thing. And this will provide that. Is it particularly hard to penetrate? Well, not enormously so. You know, oh, nice noise. It goes through. It's not enormously hard to penetrate. So this will give me a good backstop. It's not ballistic gel. Don't keep telling me it's not, but it will give me what I need, which is the comparator of one thing to another. Let's go shoot something. I'm back down the range now with my four arrow types and my rather sadly named lockdown longbow. I know, but it does the job. One chronograph, get some speed measurements off it and a straw target. There is a section of plywood and cardboard multi-layers at the top because if you shoot a barbed head into a target, you never get it out. So that allows me to get it out of that one. So let's go. First one up is the Type 7. 177.5 feet per second. Next up, the Type 9. 1.5 180.8 feet per second. It does kick some. Next up is the M2. 193.5. It's a bit lighter that one. And last up now is our Type 16. 206.4. Just coming up to target now. So you can see the bottom three there, uh, which have all gone in and are well out the other side. So again, you would not want to be struck by them, that is for sure. And then let's come up here. You can just see my stack of six layers of six mil quarter inch plywood and cardboard. And let's see if it's done its job. It feels like it has. And then, yeah, there we go. So the Type 16 has not come out the back face which is exactly what we wanted. But it looks like not too far from it, I would think. Slight update. That tiny little pimple there is in fact the tip of the Type 16 just poking out the back of that material stack. So again, pretty impressive. This data table here I'm flashing up shows all the information for the different arrow types, but it's also duplicated in the notes. So go and have a look for it there. My films are not rigorous scientific experiments. They're really just me messing about, but I'm honest about what I do and how I do it. And I'm honest about the results I show you. And you can then interpret that however you want. But I'll say it again. These arrows are the right dimensions, the right weights. They travel at the right speeds. They even oscillate in the right kind of way. I showed you that slow-mo footage there. The target doesn't care what the arrow is shot out of. It's what the arrow does. And basically, as far as I can see, this is pretty much indivisible from being launched from a longbow, even though I'm shooting it from my rather rubbishy Chinese compound crossbow. That makes it very easy now for me to be able to do these kind of tests in the backyard and establish that basically they are correct. So what's next for the lockdown longbow? Shields. Will this protect you from an arrow? Will it stop it or will it just go straight through your arm? I don't know. Let's find out. Properly made shield against properly moving arrows. Let's do it. Next episode.